sermon today continues in our series on the Gospel of Matthew, and in particular in the Sermon on the Mount, following closely upon the sermon last week, as they really are part of the same um, message of our Lord. The title of my sermon this morning is How God's Children Pray. Last week the title was How God's Children Give. This week you can see the similarity, How God's Children Pray. When my brother and I were in kindergarten, uh, because yes, I have a twin, and when we were in kindergarten together, my mom prayed for us every day before school started. She prayed for us. And she insisted when she did that, that we close our eyes while she prayed. It was, a, it was an important thing. To, she would insist that we close our eyes. And I thought this was a very strange thing. I thought it was very strange indeed because she would pray while she was driving us to school. She was driving a car at the time that she was praying for us while insisting that we close our eyes. You can see the, the perplexity I had as a five-year-old kid about that. To this day, I am so, so very grateful to my mom for her prayers. I am also grateful that she kept her eyes open while she prayed for us in the car. In verse 1, Jesus says, beware. Do you see that in verse 1? Matthew chapter 6, verse 1, beware. Watch out. Because there's a danger that you need to open your eyes to see. And that danger is right in front of you. When, whenever you do religious things to be noticed by others, even in part motivated by the idea that others will see what you do. And Jesus says, beware. Jesus implies that if you practice your righteousness in order to be seen by others, to be noticed by others, it will land you in hell. This is the implication of having no reward from your heavenly Father. Look with me again at verse 1, and you can see that this is the implication of what he says there. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. We saw last week in those four verses that Christians... God's children is another word for it in, the, in this passage. Christians get to live their whole life knowing this great comforting truth that our Father sees us. His eye is on us. He always watches over His children. What a wonderful comfort that is. But that means that you as a Christian must, must then respond to that. You must reciprocate that. You must live your life then not to please other people or please yourself, but to please God. His eye is on you. And that shows each of us just how twisted up we are inside, doesn't it? That point gets pretty personal. We are to live our lives to please God, our Heavenly Father. So you must make it your aim, if you're a Christian, to please your Father in Heaven. You must make it your ambition to know His smile, to take joy in His smile. To look forward to His reward is another way of saying that. Jesus said in verse 4, look at that again. There's a promise there in verse 4 that we ended with last week. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Well, praise God. To be a Christian, it means reciprocating to God in the way of doing religious things, doing specific, certain things, not to please others, but to please God. You do them back to God. You, you do certain things in your life because you are a child, a son or daughter of God. And because God is your Father in heaven, you live your life differently because of who God is to you. 
That's what it means to be a Christian. That's what it means for a Christian to be religious. It's to respond to God in the way you live. To live for God. So Jesus repeated that promise that he said in verse 4. He repeats it three times in these 18 verses of Matthew chapter 6. In verse 4, the second part of verse 4, he says... And your Father who, is, who sees in secret will reward you. And then again at the second part of verse 6, today, the, the passage we're looking at today. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And again in the second part of verse 18, at the end of this whole section, Jesus says again the third time, And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Do you know what promise is true? If there's ever a true promise in the Bible, it's this one. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you when you live your life for him. Each time Jesus makes that promise, it comes right after giving an example, a picture, of how the religious life is different for the child of God, for the Christian, than for anybody else in the world. In the area of giving to the needy, he said, in verses 1 to 4. In the area of fasting, we'll see next time, in verses 16 to 18. And in the area that we're looking at today when it comes to prayer, in verses 5 to 8. So, you're looking at your Bible and you see verses 5 through 8. Jesus gives us the second of three pictures of how a Christian should live for God, not to be noticed by others, like verse 1 said, but how Jesus here gives us a picture of how you are, how who you are to God must change even the way you pray. And to do this, Jesus, he gives us contrasts. He contrasts the right way to pray with two wrong ways to pray. And then he tells people how to pray in that Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer begins in verse 9. It comes immediately after these, this portion about how a Christian should pray differently than other people. And the Lord's Prayer is so rich and full, isn't it? There is so much to draw out and learn from in the Lord's Prayer. Wouldn't you agree with that? It's profound. So it's way too much for this sermon today. That's why I'll be leaving it till later on. And this, this sermon today will focus on just these verses 5 through 8, introducing the Lord's Prayer, as it were. So to help you maybe follow along then, I put three headings on the screen. And my headings are, first, don't pray like a Pharisee. Second, don't pray like a pagan. And third, pray like a Christian. So first, don't pray like a Pharisee. Look with me again at verse 5. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. Well, the first thing that's, that's obvious about this passage here, about the, this verse, how Jesus describes the way that the Pharisees liked to pray was that they fell straight headlong into that pitfall that he warned about in verse 1, didn't they? They prayed to be noticed by others. He even says they love it. Did you see that word? They love it when they're noticed by others. In other words, when they pray, what they want is for people to see them praying. They want to be known as the kind of men who pray. Because their focus isn't on God, but on themselves. And that's the first way you're not supposed to pray, according to Jesus. Now, he says here uh, about the hypocrites, don't be like the hypocrites. But he's talking about the Pharisees, and that becomes more obvious in a story Jesus one time told uh, to make a point, a parable, about a tax collector and a Pharisee who went up to the temple to pray. And the Pharisee stood where everyone could see him, and the Pharisee said out loud, and this is his prayer, it's a written prayer, I suggest you do not copy this, you do not read this for your own personal devotions, you don't ever imitate this. This is a negative way to pray. He says, God... I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector over here. I fast twice a week. This is how he prayed. 
I give tithes of all I get. But Jesus said the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift his eyes to heaven. Would not even lift his eyes to heaven. He couldn't even look up. But he beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's in Luke 18. And in that parable, the Pharisee was speaking to God, but his words were intended for a human audience, weren't they? He was performing. The tax collector, on the other hand, he stood far off, Jesus said, away from the crowd. And he couldn't even bring himself to look up. His sin weighed so heavily on his conscience. He beat his chest. You ever know what that's like when the anxiety and the distress and the turmoil in your heart is so profound and so deep? There's such a tumult that you, you, you have to do something and you, do you know the feeling? This is how that man prayed, that tax collector in Jesus' parable. He asked God for mercy while admitting he didn't deserve it. Be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus concluded in Luke 18, 14 that, that God answered the humble man's prayer but refused the Pharisee's prayer. But the Pharisee's religion is so impressive. You just look what he does. He fasts twice a week. He gives tithes of all he gets. He's such a religious person. How can he have no reward? God rejected his prayer because he didn't do it for God. He did it to be noticed by others. And here in verse 5, Jesus says that Pharisees who pray like that, that hypocrites, they have received their reward. That's it. The attention they get, that's the reward. Whatever people give them because they think they're great spiritual men, that's their reward. That's all they're going to get. Meaning they wanted to be noticed by people. And that's all their prayers are ever going to get them. So Jesus here is giving a picture of how a hypocrite prays so that we'll learn from it, so that w the right way to pray is easier to see. It's like Jesus is taking a very, very black, a deep, polished, black blackboard, and he's writing on it the right way to pray with brilliant white chalk. And the contrast makes it easier to see what he's teaching us. You can compare the Pharisees' prayer now to the way Jesus teaches us to pray in verse 6. But when you go to pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Hmm. To, to make this clear, you can separate verse 6 into two parts the way in which Jesus says you're supposed to pray, and the reason Jesus says you pray that way. There's two parts in verse 6. The way in which you pray, see what he says, is privately. You pray privately. And here it's against the contrast. It's the white chalk on the blackboard. It's, it's the contrast is showing you not to pray publicly for the sake of attention that you might receive like the, the hypocrites do, like the Pharisees do. It's the opposite of drawing attention to yourself. That's the point he's making here. Not forbidding public prayers. We pray in church all the time. There's many examples of public prayer in the New Testament, much less the Old Testament. But making a contrast here with the attention-seeking hypocrites who just wanted to be noticed by others. They were praying for people. In contrast to them, the right way to go about praying is secretly privately, whether you're in front of a group of people or not, but only to God, talking only to God. You can do that anytime. You can do that in private. You can do that in the washroom. You can do that in your bedroom. You can do that while you're driving a car. But like my mom did, I, I advise you, I advise you to keep your eyes open while you do that. And if because if, if you close your eyes while you're praying in the car, you'll probably, well, God sees you all the time. But you see my point. If you're praying with your eyes closed while driving a car, you're going to see God a lot sooner than you expected. Right? The point is here that 
your words are only meant for God when you pray. It's a sacred thing, a holy thing to pray. In the parable in Luke 18, the, the one about the Pharisee and the, the tax collector who beat his breast and cried for mercy. The tax collector was also praying in public, wasn't he? He was off to the side, but he was there in the temple. People could see him. His words, though, were only meant for God. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And back in verse 1, in chapter 6, where we are, Jesus implies that practicing your righteousness should only ever be intended to be seen by God, your Father who sees in secret. That's why he keeps repeating this point, your Father who sees in secret. And here in verse 6, that's exactly the reason Jesus says you must pray this way. This is the second part of verse 6. This is why. It's all wrapped up in who God is and who you are to God. Jesus calls God your Father. Your Father who sees. Your Father who sees you in private, who sees you in secret. The Father who sees what no one else sees. This is your Father. Which means that every time you pray, you're talking only to your Father. Now look at the second part of verse 6. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Let me make an obvious application about this. When Jesus says to pray in private, he's teaching you that the Father sees you. He sees the private prayers of his children. And he rewards the private prayers of his children. And he rewards them one day in a future day publicly so that the whole world can see that you belong to him. And Jesus is not here talking about how to get God to answer every one of your prayers the way you want. This is not talking about how to manipulate God into your corner. Jesus is talking about the fact that for the Christian, God is at the heart of who you are. You are completely dependent upon God. Like a child, like a son or a daughter. Whether you realize it or not, you need him for everything. And he watches over you with love. If you are a child of God, united by faith to his son, to Jesus Christ, that's the status that you get as a child of God. By joining yourself to Jesus. And he watches over you with love. And God never gives you any privacy. He sees you in secret. There are no walls or doors that you can put up between you and God. He's there in your room with you. He's closer than your skin. And this should change how you pray, shouldn't it? Do you even pray? Does how often you pray show that your Father in Heaven really is at the heart of who you are? That He is your meaning, He is your purpose, He's your provider, He's your sufficiency? And does the way you pray show that you know that He's with you? He's always with you? God is omnipresent. There is no place you can run to flee from His presence, the Scripture says. Does the way you pray show that He sees you? God is omniscient. He knows everything. All the time. So then if you wanted to picture then how to pray, you could picture it like Jesus, taking a cue from Jesus here, that we are children and God is our Heavenly Father. You could picture it like this. You could picture praying as if you come to Him. And you let Him pick you up off the floor and you, He puts you on His knee. And you're a small child and so you lay your head against His chest. And he maybe rubs the hair that you used to have on the top of your head. 
And like a welcome child, you open your heart to him. You open your heart to him. This is the first way that you are, that who you are to God must change how you pray. And next, the second way to pray is contrasted with another bad example. Don't pray like the pagans. We see this in verse 7. Now, I I say pagans here because I'm doing this on purpose to draw out the idea behind what Jesus calls the Gentiles. The word Gentiles throughout the New Testament always means the nations. In fact, it's where we get the word ethnic from. It's ethnoi in Greek. It just means the nations. And so Gentiles means all the other people in the world other than the Jews in the New Testament. It means the nations, but they were pagan nations, which is the point Jesus draws from in this example of how not to pray. See, God chose Israel as the nation through whom he's made himself known to all the nations on the earth. But coming to know God, whether you're Jew or Gentile, will necessarily, it will have to change the way people pray. So that as sinners come to Jesus, they don't pray like pagans anymore. You don't pray like you used to. You've got to learn a new way to pray. You've got to learn to pray like who you now are, like children of a beloved Heavenly Father. You need to pray like Jesus teaches you to pray. It should not need to be said that you can't be a Christian and keep on praying to other gods. That should never need to be said. You, you also couldn't be a Christian and keep on relying on other things. That needs to be said more often. But we do need this reminder that we can't be Christians and keep praying like the nations do. Well, there's a little old church building near my house. I called it a church building. That has a so-called prayer labyrinth on its property. And people walk that labyrinth. It's like a maze drawn on the ground. They walk that labyrinth repeating the same prayers over and over again. That's the purpose of the prayer labyrinth. If you grew up Roman Catholic, you know about rosary beads. The little beads, right, with which you count your Hail Marys. Even in Eastern Orthodox churches, they similarly use prayer ropes to count the repetitions of their prayers. If you pray like Jesus teaches, like a child to your Father in Heaven, you don't need those things. Those things are praying like the Gentiles do, like the nations do. What's wrong with those things is that they they all fall into this pitfall of praying like the nations, like pagans. In verse 7, in verse 7, Jesus describes the nations, the Gentiles who worship other gods, using repetition to try to make their prayers effective. Again, in verse 7, it says, And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, And this is the reason, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. You can see Jesus' point here. They're trying to make God listen to them. Their God, whoever that is, whatever demon or idol that is, they're trying to make their God hear them. So they keep repeating themselves and heaping up empty phrases. That's what's wrong with this way of praying. People who claim to be Christians have been doing it for centuries. They pray to idols, statues of saints and angels. They pray to Mary. They pray different prayers on different days and repeat them over and over again. They repeat their words again and again and count them out on their beads or ropes. And they think that makes God want to listen to them or more likely to be gracious to them. They misunderstand the entire relationship that we have with God through Jesus Christ. You see, they misunderstand that we are God's children. We don't need to do things to make him hear us. Christ already did that. When the prophet Elijah faced off against 450 other prophets of Baal for a prayer showdown on Mount Carmel, they had their wood piles and their sacrifices prepared, and the only rule was that their God had to light the match, had to light the fire to, the, to the, the burnt offering. 
That was the only rule. So the 450 prophets of Baal, they, they prayed and prayed and prayed for Baal to send fire. 1 Kings 18 says, They called upon the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, Oh, Baal, answer us. But there was no voice, and no one answered. And they limped around the altar that they'd made, and at noon Elijah mocked them, saying, Cry louder, for he is a god. Either he is musing, or he's relieving himself, which means he was using the bathroom, or he's on a journey, or perhaps he's asleep and must be awakened. And they cried aloud and cut themselves after their custom with swords and lances until the blood gushed out upon them. 1 Kings 18, they kept it up all day long. But there was no voice and no one answered. Rosary beads and labyrinths assume that if you say the right words enough times, maybe God will hear you and grant your request. The way the Gentiles pray, heaping up empty phrases. If you could picture that. Picture the pile of empty phrases. It's the deep black back, uh, deep black back, deep black blackboard on which Jesus paints a picture of how to pray with brilliant white chalk. As he pictures next, how God changes how you pray. Look at verse 8. Look at verse 8. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. See the first part there. Do not, see what it says in verse 8? Do not be like them. The right way to pray starts with knowing that God already hears and already knows because you're not like them. You're not strangers to God. You are his children through Jesus Christ. Don't be like other people who are not God's children when you pray to your Father. He already hears and he already knows. The end of verse 8 is profound. Your Father already knows what you need. It says, before you ask him. Well, then why pray? Why pray? He already knows. He knows what you're going to say. He knows what you need. Why pray? This is a very big truth about God that can lead to a very big misunderstanding about how to pray. Right there in verse 8, what God already sees, what God already knows, His omniscience, that He is all-knowing, it should change how you pray in the right way. Jesus teaches that not only is God your Father, but he already knows what you're going to ask before you even think of it, before you ask. He knows what you need before you know what you need. Before you tell him. And what you pray is not for the purpose of informing God. When you pray, you're not telling God anything he didn't already know. That could never be true if he's God. None of what you say is news to him. This adds a little more depth to everything we've already learned about God here. He sees everything. He knows everything. He remembers everything. That's how he rewards you for what you do in secret. He remembers what you do. And this is what, it, what we mean when we say God is all-knowing, and we take great comfort in that, and it guides us in how to pray. But it doesn't discourage us from praying. It encourages us to praying. Because our words will never convince him to act. It is his heart, his disposition towards sinners through Jesus Christ that convinces him to act. It is his graciousness, his love that persuades him to act. God is intended to act from before the universe existed. Your prayer, introduced nothing, your prayer introduces nothing new to this. So according to God's own Son, our Lord, the only right way to pray to God needs to always begin. And we need to consciously remind ourselves, God already knows. But Jesus then goes further. He goes further than just giving us this abstract theological truth. He reminds us of the relationship. The relationship we have with God as children to a Heavenly Father. 
And that's why we pray. He is our Father. We are children. Just as we sang in the beautiful song, Adam led us in just a few minutes ago. All the hardships in life, they bring us to our needs so that we turn to our Father. And that's the point. We need Him. So the reason we pray is not to inform God about our needs. It's to bring our needs to God. You could say that in the collective singular. You could say just to bring our neediness to God, our need to God. To confess our need. I need you so much, Lord. John Piper said one time, he begins every day by getting up, rolls his feet out of bed and says, Jesus, I need you today. Oh, I think that's wise. You confess our need and, and then you look up to our Father's face. You look up. Praying like a pagan means that you assume somehow that if your prayer is going to be effective, if it's going to work, it depends somehow on how you pray. And praying like a true child of God who believes in Jesus Christ that Jesus already died for your sins on the cross, that you are now forgiven and you're free, you're a child in the family of God, it means learning that our greatest need is not what God could ever give us, it's God himself. We rely on him. All of our needs in this life, you think about, instead of the heaps of empty phrases, think about the heaps of your needs. How much you need, how much you lack, what you want and desire and long for. All your neediness. These are not holes for God to fill. You do not say, God, I don't have enough money. Would you fill that need? God, I, I don't have enough love. Would you fill that need? God, I'm not a good enough person. Would you fill that need? Our needs are not holes for God to fill. Like he's some kind of gardener. There are opportunities intended and created and designed by God to draw us to Him, to draw us close to Him, to make us remember we are creatures in need of our Creator. We are the whole that God fills. God's children don't get on their knees to get what they need. God's children learn from their needs to get on their knees. And there's a pitfall every one of us, I think, is always in danger of falling into right there. And Jesus warns about that in verse 1. Performing our religion, giving to the needy in the first example, praying in the second example, for what we might get from others, for what we might get, instead of simply this, to please our Father in heaven. That's why we pray. To please Him. We talk to Him. We commune with Him. We fellowship with Him. But these first 18 verses of Matthew 6, they're, they're all aimed at teaching Christians to live out their lives on this earth, walking in the truth that we have a Father in heaven who always sees, who's watching over us all the time, always caring for us. So in verse 4 and in verse 6, and in verse 18, Jesus repeats the same promise, the same point, three times. And your Father, who sees in secret, will reward you. When you look at this whole passage of Scripture, verse 1 through 18, this portion of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, and it was only one part of the sermon. But these pictures about who you are to God and how who you are to God should change the way you live your religious life in giving and in praying and in fasting. Among these pictures... Prayer is at the center of it all. It's the middle one. You have pray, giving to the needy and then praying and then fasting. It's the middle one. It's like these illustrations of how to live the Christian life religiously, responding to God rightly as a child to the Father. These examples are arranged like jewels around the center diamond. The crown jewel and that, that gem gleaming brilliantly at the heart of it all is the Lord's Prayer. 
which leads to my third heading. Pray like a Christian. Pray like a Christian. There's a very good reason when you look at verse 9. Just the first couple of words in verse 9 that Jesus says, pray then like this. Why does he bother? Why does Jesus bother to tell us how to pray? And the reason is that even Christians, we have a tendency to pray like non-Christians. That's our tendency. Jesus is talking in the Sermon on the Mount. He's addressing believers. He's addressing his followers. The Sermon on the Mount is written for Christians. And if you're not a Christian, when you hear the words of Jesus, well, you need to repent. You need to recognize your sin, confess your sin, and ask for forgiveness. Like that tax collector, God, have mercy on me. I am a sinner. Have mercy on me. And Jesus said that man went home justified. He went home forgiven. He went home declared clean and righteous by God in God's sight. If you're not a Christian, you need to repent. You need to trust Jesus and ask. You need to pray, trusting in Jesus that God will forgive those who ask. The Bible says he will. But if you're a Christian, if you already believe, you already are a child of God. Do you pray like God is at the heart of all you do for him, of how you live, like the Lord's Prayer is at the heart of this whole passage in verses 1 through 18? Like God is at the center of your life. That he is the center of your life. Like your entire life is grounded upon him and for him and through him and to him. Are there ways in which you find yourself praying like a hypocrite for others to hear? I have to tell you that as I thought about that question for myself, I had to say, well, yes, I do that. I do that, and I'm sure you do too. We think about what we pray and how we pray, especially when we're with other people. We think about the words we pray. We think about, I, I, I want to I use nice words. I want to use impressive words. I want to I pray a beautiful prayer. I want people to hear me pray that kind of prayer. Are there ways in which you pray like a Gentile? like a pagan, a hypocrite, for others to hear. And you try to convince, rather for God to hear, but you're trying to convince God that he needs to listen to you. Are there ways that you plead and you keep saying the same thing, asking God somehow, why aren't you listening, God? I've told you what I need. Why aren't you doing it, God? Please, God, if you do this, I'll do this. Do you try to persuade God to give you what you want? That's not how Jesus teaches Christians to pray. And the question we need to ask ourselves is this. Do you know God? Do you know him? And if you're a Christian, I'm not suggesting that you're a stranger to God or he's a stranger to you. I'm saying you need to know more about him so that you pray more in light of who he is. Now, I said I was going to leave the Lord's Prayer for another sermon because there's so much more in the Lord's Prayer that I could possibly tack on now at this point in the morning. But I want you to notice that the, Lord, the Lord's Prayer in verses 9 to 15, it sits at the middle of these three pictures of how Christians are to live in God's presence while on this earth with our Father who sees in secret, always remembering and being ready to reward us on the last day. He gives the example of giving to the needy, of praying and fasting, all about living life to please our Father in heaven. That's the reason we live, to please our Father in heaven as he watches over the children he loves. But we see in this whole passage, prayer is at the heart of it all. If God is at the center of everything for you, why don't you talk to him? That's why prayer is at the heart of it all here. It's the most essential ingredient for faith. That we speak to the God we love and the God who we believe, we count in the gospel that he loves us and accepts us through Jesus Christ. So why aren't we praying? 
It's the heart of it all for the Christian. And when Jesus teaches his disciples how to pray, the Lord's Prayer is this shining, positive example of how to really pray like God really is your Father. And isn't that fitting? That prayer is at the center of this whole passage. Just as talking to God should that be the, the heartbeat of how every Christian lives every single day. Well, that's how Jesus teaches us to pray in the Lord's Prayer. If you wanted to see a preview of what those verses contain, he teaches us to pray to our Father in heaven. He teaches us to seek the Father's honor. Hallowed be your name. He teaches us to ask for what God's, God wants, to, to put his will first, just as our, our Lord did in the garden before he died. Not my will, but yours be done. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He teaches us to ask for what we need each day, what we really need each day, and trust our desperate needs to him. Give us our bread each day. He teaches us to ask him to forgive our sins. To forgive our sins. He teaches us to ask to be led from temptation and delivered from evil. This is a prayer that holds up God. It's a marvelous prayer, isn't it? It's a prayer that holds up God as the only sufficient supplier of everything his children ever need. It's a God-centered prayer. It's a God-glorifying prayer. It's a God-pleasing prayer. Do you want to please God? Do you want to to please God. It's a prayer that turns to God from our need because He's the one we need. He's the one, the only one that can meet and does meet all of our physical and our spiritual needs in His wisdom, in His time, in His love. This is a prayer that acknowledges our need. We need forgiveness. Do you know that you need forgiveness all the time? And it's promised. We never have to wonder if he'll forgive us. We just have to ask. And he forgives us. Well, pray. Are you like that tax collector who can't even look up? The weight of your guilt is so strong, so heavy. Well, pray. Ask. See, the Lord's Prayer is a prayer that depends on God to keep us safe from sin and even from our own sin and from evil. It's a childlike prayer because it confesses how much we rely on our Father and how good and strong He is. It's like little kids when they get hurt. Yesterday I watched as I saw James climbing our back stairs and he stumbled and he hurt himself and we, Heather and I were sitting down on the patio and we heard him. We heard this happen. And there was silence for that moment. You know, just that silence before the storm. And then the cry came. And he came back down the stairs and he came over to where I was sitting with Heather, but he came to Heather. <laughs> he went straight to Heather and she hugged him. He hurt himself. He found his mummy. She hugged him. Then you know what he did? Immediately he stopped crying and went back to playing. Just like that. That was all he needed. His need drove him to find his mom. His mom reminded him that everything's going to be okay. I think we need to see our hardships and our pain and our cancer and our debt and our job losses and the deaths in our life. We need to see them like this. They are those things God designs to teach us we need him. And if we have him, if he is our heavenly father and he sees in secret, everything's going to be okay. What a great truth is glimpsed in this little ordinary event in the life of every single child every single day. You're never safer than when your need brings you to seek the face of your father in heaven. You're never safer. Everything's going to be okay. 
when you present your request before him, seeking mercy and grace and help in time of need, as Hebrews 4, 16 says. Because his eye is on his children, his ear is open to the humble, and he knows your need before you ask. So this is the faith that pleases God, to depend on him like that. As Hebrews eleven six says, For without faith it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. He rewards those who seek him. Jesus said, And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. So, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen.